So I'm Henry Amos, I'm director of Bright Blue Studio. Uh, we are down on the Fishkey in North Shields, which is at the mouth of the Tyne, and we're a little atelier architectural practice um, that specialises in ecological buildings. So this is uh, Hawksley Wildlife Discovery Centre, uh, just outside Amble and Morpeth in Northumberland. The coast is just a mile, less than a mile over there, uh, with beautiful George Bay. Um, and the site is uh, quite a large um, uh, wildlife site, and the building is situated at the north end of that, and then looks out over the old working um, of the uh, coal mine that was here. Well, the site is an open cast, uh, an old open cast site, and they had an arson attack on the building that was here before. So they had no um, bird watching hide in this location here. And the Thumbland Wildlife Trust invited Brightbury Studio um, to come along and have a look and see what they could do. And what we did was we thought that, given that they're a, a wildlife trust, we could see if we could work very much more with the land and come sort of out of the land, rather than um, have a sort of like a sort of imposed sort of building. So as you come towards the building, there's a main access um, axis that goes right through the building, which we're sitting at the end of here. And, and what that does is it takes people as they come in straight through the building and out the other side and into the landscape. And that's the whole sort of real main idea about this, which is yes, the building's here, but it's about engaging with the landscape. The other bit of that is that the building is of the landscape as much as in the landscape. Well, that's what we've tried to do. So we've got a number of ways of, of trying to do that. And then the building form itself has raising roofs. And what that does is it sort of embraces the landscape rather than coming down on it, opens to the landscape and is gently a sort of a wings of a bird, which certainly some people really enjoy. And, um, and there's the fact that that sequential roofs has a little feeling of a sort of a cubist feeling of movement. So that's our architectural bit. <laughs> but that access and what we hang off it, um, is, it also caused some, some issues for us uh, as a build team because it's a flexible landscape. And that, I mean by that is that we're, because we're partly in old mine workings and partly not, there's a lot of movement. And so we had to be able to absorb that. So the structural concept for the whole building um, uh, was difficult because of the, high, the nature of being across straddling the high wall. And the high wall is the edge of the old open cast mine um, and it even has Victorian mine workings underneath that so we have a flexible um, sort of substrata which we couldn't really find anything to hold on to and being a zero uh, concrete building we were looking to what sort of foundation could we have and so what, what uh, we developed with the engineer and as part of the team was a layered uh, way of building up um, the sub sort of base um, within the ground um, out of a type 1 gravel which is used under roads and what it does is sort of you, you tamp it down and it sort of sets but it has no setting agent it just fits together nicely but it can move a little bit and then what, what we've done is we've used the gabions on top of that and as far as we're aware that they've never been used in a structural sense in a habited building in the UK before there's quite an interesting sort of uh, uh, link there, which is that, that the justification partly by the engineer was that we looked at, or he looked at, uh, the, the difficulties um, in Haiti after the earthquake, and they had piles of concrete and lots of rebar. And somebody wrote a paper about how they put together gabion type structures out of this, these materials that were right there from their old houses that were, were, had been destroyed by the earthquake. And, and what, that, what the learning from that meant was that we it gave confidence to both the engineer and then the building control and stuff to say, okay, well, they have done it somewhere else. It's not just um, um, sort of a, an oddity. And so we ran that here. And so, so, so for this building, what we've got is that, that sub sort of level of, of tamping down uh, type one. And then we've got on top of it, a row of gabions which go around all the walls of the whole building. And then that gives a really good footing and lifts the straw bale just off the ground so it's nice and dry and that's what you want with straw bales and that keeps them up and yes it's nice and wide so it fitted perfectly um, because the straw bales are quite wide and then down the main axis we actually emphasized the gabions and we've used them full height here which is what we're sitting in here now and that's the main axis that drives you out into the landscape and a little bit like you're going through the remains of a quarry here with all of the the rocks around you and stuff and so the gravitas inside this sort of structure with all of the gabions and the heavy rock is rather different, I think, to the more sort of, env in sort of enveloping straw bale element you get in more of the heated internal spaces.
there are a number of ways of the gay being um, cages could be in the boxes could be made, um, and we looked at the different and uh, different types. You can also get different wire thicknesses and, and and sort of that sort of element. What we needed was something that worked here. We're we're very near the coast, um, and we have quite an exposed site, um, but we also uh, needed something not too heavy. We thought, um, and um, and we needed something that was going to last f for the length of the building. Um, but also part of the idea was that the building would go back into the ground at the end of its process. So you need something sort of sustainable, something ecological, something that was not too too hefty and something that was going to, but was still going to last. So we had this quite a sort of complex sort of thing. And also given the building and, and, and the trust and, and everything else, it had to be economic um, to, for that reason. So we, we ended up with um, these um, three millimeter galvanized cages that, that, that we're sitting in here now. I think the advantage, one of the one of the sort of side benefits of using the galvanizer was quite a technical um, structural you know requirement which was really important for us but I think an, another side of the, the advantage of the galvanizer was that it has a muted and a slightly variegated finish which um, which other finishes don't don't work um, in the same way like a you know powder coated or something it's just a far too finished far too uh, perfect finish in one sense um, and too shiny and, and then also if it's cut or in any other things then it's failing in a different sort of way whereas um, this more muted uh, more um, sort of matte finish is what we wanted to to go with the matte of the stone and and the overall feeling of the building being one of um, uh, slight variegation, slight self-identity, and uh, and so each part has its own little story.